you know, my first few private investors was just um, through networking. I call it the flap your lips method. I just started talking to people, not asking for money, but talking to people about what I did and how I did it. And um, I think this one guy in particular I'm thinking of came from a friend that was doing deals with me. And he said, hey, I know I've been talking to my friend. He's interested in investing in some real estate with us. And so I just put together a little package explaining this deal. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, your host, and my guest today is a good friend of mine. We're in Masterminds together, and he's raised hundreds of thousands of dollars of private money for his deals. He is a real estate investor. He is a creative financing consultant and outsourcing and a marketing expert. In addition to that, He's also an expert on flipping properties remotely, and he's going to tell you all about how to virtually do land deals as well. He's the host of a very, very popular podcast by the name of the Real Estate Investing Mastery Podcast, and he's also the author of four different real estate investing books. Now, my friend and guest knows what it feels like to be stuck. Like, you know, have you ever felt like you can't get any traction when it comes to your income or your lifestyle? Well, he was there and he knows that there is another way. His life changed completely when he discovered real estate investing and lease options. Now, his three keys to business success is marketing, automation, and delegation. Like myself, he's an avid family guy. And nothing, quite frankly, is more important to him than God and family. In fact, I had my guest on a few months ago. We were going to talk about real estate, but we got so much into talking about spiritual things and uh, Christianity and God and family that we didn't ever really get around to real estate. Well, we're getting into real estate today in the next few moments. In just a moment, you're going to meet once again my friend and guest, Mr. Joe McCall, right after this. Well, Joe, welcome back to Raising Private Money. Hey, Jay. How are you? I am fantastic. So good to see you again. Uh, Thank you. you. You're looking fantastic still again since you went through your health challenges earlier in the year and all that. And so how are you feeling? I'm feeling much, much better, Jay. Thank you so much. I am um, yeah, I'm feeling great. Good, 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 good. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing you soon uh, also in one of our upcoming mastermind meetings. Well, as I promised in my introduction, let's go ahead and dive in to the show and, and dig into this, this thing called real estate investing and how you go about doing it. Um, in the first few minutes, I'd like for us to talk about your experience in raising private money. I know you've raised hundreds of thousands in the past in private money. And what that looked like, what your experience was, how you went about doing it. And then I want to segue right on over into your expertise and what you've got going on these days. First of all, private money. It's been my experience, Joe, uh, with myself, uh, many of my other guests that have raised private money, that what happened was they just didn't wake up one day and say, you know, I think I'll go raise me some private money. Typically, there was an event. There was something that happened in their business that caused the real estate investor to say, or to go learn about private money because there was a need there. What's your story as to what it was that triggered you to raise private money in the past? Um, well, before I forget, I was thinking of this while you were saying this. Um, it's always important to dig your well before you're thirsty, right? And so it's so important to get a book like yours or to get a program like yours that teaches people how to um, dig their well to get their private money before they actually need it, right? So that's an important thing to understand. 
dig your well before you're thirsty. But at the time I was, um, man, I, I, I was doing a lot of owner financing deals and subject to deals. Now subject to deal is something where you, um, you're taking over an existing mortgage. Okay. equity in the deal. The seller wanted $5,000 to walk away from the deal and it needed about $5,000 in repairs. So I had to bring in $15,000. And so um, I, at the time I had a coach who was talking about, listen, if you get a good deal, the money will come. The money is easy if you have a good deal. And so I realized that the most important part of this was finding a good deal where it made sense. And so at the time, when I was borrowing private money, I made sure my private investors in, okay, I hope I'm not getting too technical here, but the mortgage that was already existing is in first position, right? And so when I put in a private investor into the deal, they were in second position. That's right. Now I always made sure that my private investors never, uh, I never borrowed more than 80% of the total value of the home. Mm -hmm. um, so I still had 20% equity in there to protect my private investor. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I had a good deal and um, I needed $15,000 to get the loan current, to give the seller some cash so they could walk away and to put into some minor repairs into the house. And, um, and then I would uh, do the repairs and I would put a tenant buyer in the house and I would do what's called a lease option. Um, and so, you know, I just, you know, my first few private investors was just um, through networking. I call it the flap your lips method. I just started talking to people, not asking for money, but talking to people about what I did and how I did it. And um, I think this one guy in particular I'm thinking of came from a friend that was doing deals with me. And he said, hey, I know I've been talking to my friend. He's interested in investing in some real estate with us. And so I just put together a little package explaining this deal what it was worth, how much equity was in it, how much we were wanting to borrow, what we were going to do with the money. And then, and I was totally open book and shared everything exactly what we're doing. I think we paid 12% interest. And uh, I, I did make some mistakes early on because um, this was 2006 and seven. And back then it was easy to borrow private money um, because real estate was always going up. And so I put a clause in my contract at the time that said, Hey, you can, if you want your investment back, just give me a 90 day advance notice. Another investor's money. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, fast forward a couple of years when the market tanked in 2008 and nine, all of a sudden all my private investors, they wanted their money back and they started saying, Hey, we, we have 90 days now. And then 90 days come and like, I can't find another private investor to replace their money because the value started plummeting, right? So I didn't have enough equity. So it was scary for a period of time. I paid all of my private investors back. Some of them, it took me about four or five years to pay them back. Even after I lost the house, we did a short sale on the house or a couple of them. We did some, had some foreclosures and I almost went bankrupt during this whole time, but I didn't. And every private investor that I had, I paid back even after I lost the house. And I just told them, you know, I can't give you any security for this debt, but you're just going to have to take my word for it. And I will pay you back. Some, some of them um, said, if you can just pay us back the principal of what you owe and not, don't, we won't worry about interest. Some of them said, I still want my interest, buddy. You know, and, and uh, where before I had maybe a balloon of five years, they said, just just put, they, they, I put them on like a 15 year amortization and mm -hmm. I just paid them every single month and they all got paid back. So anyway, when I needed the money, the first lesson was I made, I had to make sure it was a good deal. And I made the deal sell itself 
which was make it e make made it easy to get the private money. Now nobody could have predicted that the market was going to crash like it did. Um, but I think what's important to understand, and and now when I'm talking to private investors, I tell them my story. I'm completely honest with what happened before. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I tell them I paid every single one of my private investors back. And when I do my podcast or when I'm teaching real estate, I tell everybody that your private investors um, always get profit first before you get any profit out of a deal. They always get paid first before you ever get paid anything out of a deal. You need to make sure their interest is protected more and above yours. That's my uh, philosophy on that. So anyway, mm -hmm. um, I, I think if, if, if people listening to this learn how to become good at getting deals, the money will take care of itself. It really will. If you get a good deal, you will find the money. Um, there may be somebody in a Facebook group. You know, a lot of a lot of the places I borrow private money from now on my vacant land deals are from other people that are doing vacant land themselves. But they're busy. They have a full time job. They don't want to do the work of doing the marketing and finding the deals. So I find the deals and I, I talk about my deals and I say, hey, anybody want to partner with me on this deal? I'll either give you 10 or 15 percent of the profits or I'll pay you 10 percent interest. And um, I get people out of the woodwork like, oh, my gosh, that's a good deal. Yeah, I'd love to partner with you on that deal. And you can find those kinds of folks in Facebook groups and real estate investment clubs and things like that. So mm -hmm. that's you said it. something um, you said something a few minutes ago. You said you like the flap your lips method, flap your yes. lips method. Let's drill down on that for a moment. Um, so how did I flap my lips as recent as yesterday? And, you know, I know you believe the same thing I do, Joe. Money's all around us. When you've got a, an abundant mindset and you do not have a scarcity mindset, money's all around you. So uh, just this uh, past weekend, my wife, Carol Joy, and I flew out to Texas for our niece's wedding. And it was absolutely beautiful. And so yesterday we get on the airplane in Dallas, Fort Worth to fly back here to North Carolina. And so I sit down in my seat, very nice gentleman sitting next to me. And um, so anyway, uh, after a, a sentence or two of, you know, getting settled in and talking about the weather, um, I introduced myself and, um, and I said, well, what keeps you busy? What do you do? And so he told me. And so we had an interesting conversation about that. And by the way, I never lead with what I do because in this world of attracting private money, there's no pitching, there's no selling, there's no persuading, there's no chasing. It's all about attracting the money. So here's an example about attracting. So I asked him what he did. So it's all about leading with being interested in the other person. You know, right. when I met a networking group, Joe, I tell you what just absolutely drives me bonkers. I can't stand it when somebody gives me a business card and I didn't ask for their business card. Why are you giving me your business card or, you know, whatever. And I, I didn't even express interest anyway. So I'm sitting next to this gentleman on the airplane and he's talking about what he does. And I'm genuinely interested. There's a key word, genuinely interested with childlike curiosity about this guy that I never met before. So we're talking about him. And so we're talking along and then, I don't know, five or 10 minutes into it, we had a two hour flight. What does he say to me? He says, well, what do you do? And here was my exact answer. My answer was, well, I've been investing in real estate for 20 years now. And starting back in 2009, I started putting together these lucrative real estate deals to where I have investors invest in my deals and I pay them insane high rates of return. Well, guess what we talked about for the next half hour to 45 minutes was what private money is and private lending and how you, how an individual can use self-directed IRAs to, you know, use their retirement funds along with their investment capital. So what's the takeaway from that little story? I became interested in the other person by flapping my lips, by asking them about themselves. And then there went the conversation. Yeah, that's so good. 
Very, very simple. And it's just talking. I love that, how you genuinely express interest in what they do. And when you do that, they're going to ask you, what do you do? And so you just need to practice a little 30 second elevator pitch on what you do. I'd probably say something like, yeah, you know, I, I do a lot of vacant land investing and we, we buy and sell a lot of land and we partner with private investors and we, um, we pay them secured returns on their money, uh, returns uh, secured by real estate. And we've been doing this a long time and it's, it's a lot of fun. And if you just leave it at that. And leave it at that. Gonna, and, and if they're interested, they're going to explore what does that mean, right? Yeah. It's just like, there's no sales pitch here. It's genuinely yeah. interested in other people and you're just sharing. And I'll tell you one thing that I didn't wake up and smell the roses about or realize um, until a few years ago. And that was whenever I feel myself, whether it's, whether it's, whether it's selling any uh, selling or closing anything, whether it's attracting private money or talking to a seller or whatever, whenever I feel like I'm trying to persuade or I'm trying to sell or I'm trying to talk somebody into something, I back off because it's not about talking about or trying to talk somebody else into doing something. It's about providing value and how they can be a win in this whole win-win scenario. Yeah, exactly right. So we never, I, I always say, you know, the harder you chase people, the faster they run. Mm -hmm. And so we're not about chasing or selling anything. We just talk about what we do. Absolutely. So with that, let's talk about what you do, Joe. So you've got many, many years um, of real estate investing and entrepreneurial experience. And I mean, you're known in the industry uh, as a lease option expert. You've been doing lease options, you know, for years. And in addition to that, you've really become an expert in land, right? In, in, in that asset class. So let's talk about that. What are you doing with land? What's that look like? I mean, there's all kinds of ways you can do land, but tell us about what you've got going on right now that you're excited about. Well, I love vacant land. I've been doing houses for a long time and still like houses, nothing wrong with houses, but I just find vacant land is a lot easier in, in a lot of ways. It's not as competitive. It's easier to find bigger discounts in deals because it's not as competitive. And because with vacant land, the sellers are much more detached from the property. It's like it's further away. They haven't been there in years. They don't have any mortgages or debt on the property. It's just sitting out there not being used and they're just done with it and they want out of it. So we buy our vacant land for 35, 40 cents on the dollar. We sell a lot of it with cash and we sell a lot of it with owner financing. So, and with owner financing, you don't have to worry about Dodd-Frank because it's not anybody's personal residence. It's just vacant land. It's dirt. You can't do anything to destroy it. God's not making any more of it. There's still a high demand for dirt. But because we buy it so cheap in very high demand areas where there's a lot of people wanting to buy land, we can sell it very quickly. And it's a great way to get monthly cash flow without the typical landlord headaches of dealing with repairs and maintenance and tenants and all of that stuff. So um, I love vacant land. You know, we can we can buy a deal for an example deal might be I'll just get my calculator out here real quick. An example deal, let's say a property is worth, they're selling for $35,000, okay? Now you're talking, about, you're talking about a lot, right? Or is, yeah. this, or is this farmland or is it a lot? Uh, it doesn't matter. Okay. So we, we do like small little quarter acre infill lots in mm -hmm. Florida, or we'll do 10, 10 acre recreational lots in North Carolina. Okay. All right. So let's say whatever it is, it sells for sometimes the further away it is, the cheaper it is per acre. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the closer. And when you say the further city, away, the further away from what? A city, a big city. Okay, got you. Yeah. So, um, you know, like, well, let me just I'll kind of explain the numbers. Like, I, I don't almost I almost don't care if it's a little quarter acre lot or if it's a 20 acre lot. I go into markets where there's high demand. So there, I'm going to areas where there's a lot of people buying land. That's all I care about. I want to follow the money. Success leaves clues. 
And I know if in the last 90 days, 500 people have bought vacant land in this county, guess what? I'm going to go into that county and I'm going to target with my direct to seller marketing. So I send letters and postcards to people who own land for over 10 years who don't live in that county. And I send them a letter. I send them a postcard. Hey, do you want to sell your land? I'll buy it. Call my 24 hour recorded voicemail. Mm -hmm. text or call my 24 hour recorded voicemail. They call that voicemail. Sometimes we call them back. Sometimes we just send them an offer. Mm -hmm. So let's say we think we could sell, we could resell that lot for $35,000. I always price my properties aggressively so I can sell it in like one or two months. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm looking at other 10 acre lots and I'm seeing that they're selling for $40,000, I'm going to sell mine for 35. I'm going to list mine for 35. So then from there, I just subtract my costs. I want to make a minimum of $10,000 wholesale fee. So I'm going to subtract $10,000. That brings it down to 25 grand. I'm going to pay a realtor 10% to resell my property. So I'm going to subtract another 3,500. I'm going to subtract a couple thousand for closing costs. And I'm going to subtract, you know, um, $500 for a photographer to go take drone footage. And I'm going to subtract a thousand dollars for my oops factor. I call it oops. <laughs> yeah, I call it my and Murphy so, factor. <laughs> yeah, Murphy factor. Well, okay, that brings me down to eighteen grand. I'll offer eighteen thousand dollars, eighteen thousand dollars on this property that's worth thirty-five thousand dollars. So eighteen thousand divided by thirty-five thousand is fifty-one percent. Um, I usually never offer more than fifty percent of what a property is worth. So I would probably offer. If it's worth, if I can sell it for 35 grand, I'm not going to offer more than 17,500. Gotcha. And that's what I offer. Right. And so think about this when you're talking about private money. Now I'm going to need $17,500 to buy this property. That's worth $35,000. Mm -hmm. How hard do you think it is to borrow money at 50% loan to value? It's like the easiest thing in the world, right? right. All you gotta do is flap your lips. And that, that my private investor is protected in first position at 50% loan to value. The, the worst thing that can happen to them is I don't pay them back. They take the property over and then they sell it. They can sell it for, I, I'm borrowing 17,000. They sell it for 30,000 and they get their principal back plus a bunch more. So um, with vacant land, I find it's actually easier in some ways to lend, to borrow money from private investors if I need to. Many times I don't, but if I needed to, because the private investor is in first position, they're not in second position and they're well protected, no more than 50% of the value of that property. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about the value of a piece of property, it's pretty easy to know the value of a lot you know, quarter acre lot or whatever that's in a subdivision. Right, right. But when you get into acreage and you don't like have as many comps or recent comps, of course, there's tax value. So, Joe, I got a great idea. Let's pretend that I have hired you to be my land investing coach. Okay. I'm going to tell you a real deal. That okay. was just presented to me this past weekend. And let's say I don't have a clue as to how to start analyzing this deal as to what I should do. All right. Okay. So for, uh, for all of our listeners here in the audience, this is a real deal going on right now. So here's the facts. The owner of this property, it's a 33 acre track of property. It's 33 Where is acres. it? What county? It's in Carteret County, North Carolina, C-A-R-T-E-R-E-T, -E -E Carteret County, North Carolina. The township is Newport, N-E-W-P-O-R-T. There's 33 acres. And for decades, maybe 100 years, but at least for decades, at least for 70 years, this 38 track of land, 38 acre track of land has been farmed. It's still being farmed and it's located here in an area where there are zero lots available to build on. We have a high demand for lots, high demand for houses. There's no inventory in the multiple listing service. There's nothing for rent. 
And, you know, people are dying. And so builders, developers are dying for land. So how did I come across this 33-acre um, parcel of land? Well, my mother's first cousin passed away about a month ago. And my mother's first cousin left everything to her stepchildren. So there's, there's two stepchildren. Both of these stepchildren do not live anywhere around here in this area. In fact, they didn't even know they were inheriting the property until they were at the graveside. And so more or less within a day or two. And so what we have here is we have this 33 acre track of land. So the executor of the estate, because that stepson has now been named as the executor, the executor of that estate reached out to me. I met him at the services and, and we had a chat and I, and I told him that, you know, I could be interested in property whenever they decided to sell. They may not even want to sell, but anyway, here I am. If, if you want to reach out. So he called me up and, um, and so he wants to sell. Here's the facts. He has no idea what the property is worth and he wants to know what I will pay him. That's where we are. So what would you do? I mean, you know, it's farmland. I haven't even looked it up yet. My, my best guess is the tax value on that farmland is much lower than it would be if it was repurposed into being able to be developed. It's being farmed. Has it got any wetlands on it? Who knows? I don't know. Um, but those how, are the facts. How well would you do? How close is it to the, uh, the, the ocean, the coast? Uh, 10 minutes. So it's not on the water. No, 10, 10 minutes. Does that, does that makes a big difference, right? I'm looking here like, so it's definitely going to be under a million dollars in my opinion, right? Cause properties well, that are over a million you, dollars. I can tell you, you cannot buy a lot that's in a developed piece of property. All right. You cannot buy a lot in a developed piece of property for less. A builder can't buy one for less than 50 grand. I mean, I think an old rule of thumb is, you know, you got a third for infrastructure and a third, I mean, your streets and whatever. And then I don't know, maybe a third you can build. So the question is, is what's your exit strategy? I mean, what's my exit strategy? I mean, do I want to be talking, you know, a percentage of tax value? Do I want to be talking to realtors? Yeah. You know, you know, how, how do I even determine what could be the exit strategy value? Well, a couple of things I'm looking at is I'm, I'm at Redfin right now and I'm looking at uh, Carteret County and I'm looking at just the actives under contract or pending vacant land that's for sale. That's over 10 acres right now in that county. OK, and I see about 19 properties that are under a million dollars that are 10 acres or more that are currently for sale in Carteret County. Carteret County isn't that big. It's pretty small. Pretty small. And there's 19 properties. And I have this little tool that I use. The um, If I look at the average price per acre, there's, there's a median price per acre and the average price per acre. I always look at whatever is the cheapest. It's about $13,000 an acre. So that's what the current list, list price is, right? So okay. if I take 13,000 times 33 acres, right? Yep. That puts the value maybe for just based on list price at about $429,000 maybe, right? Mm -hmm. Now I can, let's look at sold. Let's see if there's anything that is sold in the last year because it's too hard to get comps. If I look in the past year, there's 29 vacant lots over 10 acres that have sold in that county. So I do, I'm, I have this little scraper tool again. And I'm at about $10,800 an acre. Okay, so $10,800 are the sold comps. How many sold comps do you have on acreage? 28. Oh, wow. That, that's good. All right, is, just any of that, that is any of that waterfront? Some of it is. Mm -hmm. Some of it is. So like not knowing where exactly your property is, what I like to do is go into Redfin and I want to zoom in to where your property is and then kind of zoom out from there. Okay. Now okay. tell, tell all of our listeners, what is this Redfin, Redfin tool thing you're using? Redfin.com. It's just like Zillow. 
but I like Redfin better because it gives you more options and filtering when you're looking for properties. Mm -hmm. So you want to find your property and put it in the center of the Redfin map. And then you want to set your filters. You want to look at only land, only 10 acres or more. And, um, and then you start zooming out and then you can see, all right, all of the vacant land that is sold or is for sale in that area. Mm -hmm. And then you want to look at the average or the median. I like median because it removes the outliers, right? It removes the cheapest ones. It removes the most expensive ones. So for the active listings, the median price per acre is about 13 grand. Mm -hmm. For the solds, the median sold price per acre is about 10,800. Mm -hmm. So I kind of start with whatever one is cheaper. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's say I'm going to list it. I'm going to sell it for $10,800 an acre. Mm -hmm. So that would be 10,800 times 33 acres. I'm going to sell it for maybe about $356,000. Mm -hmm. Now you got to, what I like to do, this is a more premium property. So there's a lot of things you could do with this. And probably what I would do is I would find somebody else in that county who has done some development before in the past, who has mm -hmm. done subdividing. Um, I would find an, an active land investor who does bigger deals like this. Mm -hmm. And I would probably bring the deal to them and offer to partner, see if they wanted to partner with me on the deal. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would try to get under contract first. So if I think I can sell it for $356,000, well, you want to subtract maybe 6% for commissions. You want to make at least a $50,000 profit. So I would subtract 50 grand. Let me just do that right now. So I take 356,000 times 0.94. That takes out commissions. I want to make at least 50 grand. Mm -hmm. so I subtract 50 grand wholesale profit. It's kind of what I, the way I look at it. And I'm going to subtract maybe $5,000 in closing costs. Mm -hmm. And you're going to need to get a survey maybe and stuff like that. I don't know. That's and then I'm going to subtract um, maybe a thousand dollars for a photographer to take mm -hmm. pictures and drone footage. Um, I'm going to subtract. Let's see, I subtract realtor commissions, my profit, closing costs, uh, photography. So that brings me down to maybe three seventy eight. No, you I'll started at started at three fifty six. Yeah, so if I take three fifty six times ninety four percent. Cause that's taking out realtor commissions of 6%. Oh, okay. Subtract 50 grand for just my profit. Like I'm just thinking wholesale profit. I want to make mm -hmm. 50 grand on it. Subtract five grand for closing costs. Subtract a thousand dollars for photography. And I'm also going to, I'm going to borrow some money from a private investor. I'm going to need to pay them some interest. Mm -hmm. so I don't know how you'd work that out. Maybe you pay uh, five points, 10 points, depends on how long you borrow the money. I'm probably going to borrow some money expecting to maybe hold it for generous i don't know all right. So that gets me at about $250,000. And that's probably kind of where I would start. I would probably want to offer 250 grand and see if I'm even in the ballpark with the seller. Right. Um, how much would you, how much would you push for some kind of ballpark figure that they would, uh, you know, uh, yeah. that they would be happy and happy with. And, and given he doesn't know anything, I mean, for all I know, the tax value is only a hundred thousand dollars. I haven't looked. Well, it that's a good point. I would go find out what the tax value is. Cause sometimes you can just say to the seller, well, what if I just pay you whatever the County assesses it for? Would that be fair? Mm -hmm. And they may say, yeah, that'd be great. Well, what if the County assessed value comes in less than what you were going to offer to begin with? So sure. yeah, maybe start with the County assessed value. Right. All right. And, um, but also when I buy land, I always get a three month, a period of three months for due diligence and mm -hmm. bigger lots like this, you might want to get six months. Right. Because, um, that gives you time. I call it to verify taxes, title, and value. 
Well, there's a writer downer taxes, title, and value. Yeah. That's my due diligence. And that's completely wide open to whatever I want it to be, right? Like, I just want to verify that it's a good deal. You know, there might be environmental impact studies you have to do. There may be surveys you have to do. You may have to do a, a perk test to determine if you can put septic systems on it or not. Mm -hmm. I don't know, being close to the ocean, there's probably a lot of environmental regulations mm -hmm. that you need to be concerned about. Right. So there, you need th that kind of stuff takes a lot longer than houses. Right. The final thing I'll do is um, I, I, I'm going to talk to a realtor that does a lot of land out there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to find the biggest. Like, so just go into Redfin or Zillow and find the ones who have sold. to help me sell this you mm -hmm. we, you wouldn't be interested in it would you um so i i tell them about the deal i tell them i'm an investor i'm from out of town i need some help with this thing i also when i'm talking to realtors i always tell them i pay i pay generous commissions so i'm not looking for them to do a bunch of free work for me right i want them to uh you know so a lot of these realtors especially in these bigger deals it's easier to find realtors willing to help you than the normal little thirty thousand dollar deals that i do Right. But these realtors, they'll go look at the property, you know, and they'll tell you what it's like. And they'll tell you all about the county. They'll tell you what the zoning is, what the restrictions are, if there are any. They'll tell you, uh, oh, my internet went down. I can't look this property up anymore. But anyway, they'll tell you if it's in an HOA, what the restrictions are. Mm -hmm. In Florida, where we do a lot of deals, they'll tell you, yeah, there's these scrub jays you need to watch out for. And I don't know what even scrub jays are. They're some kind of either turtle or a bird or... Uh, <laughs> The red -headed, the red headed know. woodpecker. <laughs> yeah, but like that's a big deal in parts of Florida and they're endangered species. Mm -hmm. So if you have what looks like a scrub jay nest on this vacant lot, you're going to have to pay $5,000 or whatever to get it moved and remediated and fixed or whatever. Mm -hmm. So these kinds of things, that's why you need at least three to six months for due diligence to turn. So the realtor will tell you and a realtor is going to tell you yeah, we could sell this thing for, you know, three hundred dollars to $400,000. So whenever I'm talking to a realtor, I want them to understand. I, I want to sell this thing in like one or two months. I don't want to hold it mm -hmm. for six to 12 months. You know, I want to sell it as fast as possible. So what is the most aggressive price that you can list it for that I can sell it in one or two months? All right. And then finally, I'll say this. Um, I know North Carolina is a great state and there's a lot of land investors that are doing deals in North Carolina. And so I would go and I would start looking for land investors, some of the bigger ones that are doing the subdivides. Mm -hmm. um, because sometimes these guys get really creative. Let's say, you know, you're willing, you're going to offer the seller 250. And they're like, no, the, I, I, the most, the least I would accept would be 400. So you're way apart, right? Well, mm -hmm. what if you got creative with the seller and said, what if we did this? Um, and I've never done this. I just heard of other investors doing this. You offer some kind of offer to the seller where you buy it at a certain price and then you split, you share the profits mm -hmm. with the seller of anything above that price. Right. And if, and if I only do this, if they carry the financing. Mm -hmm. So what if you own, set up, a, make an offer to the seller at their price with owner financing payments start in six months, in 12 months or whatever, okay? And they get a certain percentage of the profits out of the deal. So you do all the work, they carry the financing, and then you do the work of, of getting it, you know, getting it rezoned, taking it to the county, getting it in, adding entitlements, getting it subdivided, whatever. And then you could sell it possibly by the parcel, maybe break it up into eight, four acre parcels or 16, two acre parcels and sell each parcel one at a time. And then just, you could work out an agreement where you split the profits with the seller. So um, <clears throat> now that's kind of, you know, it's above my pay grade. I don't do those bigger deals like that. But my I'm saying is there are people that do, 
and you can go find them just by you know looking in the county records who are the investors that are buying a lot of land in public records there um you know call these realtors who have sold vacant land recently in that in that county mm -hmm. and ask them hey do you know uh, any investors that do subdividing you know that do this kind of stuff and you can call them and talk to them and, and bring them the deal and say, Hey, I think I got a deal here, but this is outside of my wheelhouse. Do you want to partner with me on this? Right. And you might, that's, that's, that's what I would do. I love it. Well, Joe, you didn't know you were going to be doing uh, coaching on land on the show, did you? <laughs> <laughs> but I love this kind of stuff. This is me too. Me too. Well, again, so just to remind everybody on the land, your expertise wheelhouse when it comes to land looks like what? And then I want you to give them the website as to how they can connect with you and learn even more about it. By the way, um, I'll give you my website in a minute here. I just found a property that sold in January. So about, what is that? 10 or 11 months ago. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, 29 acres for $500,000. Okay. Right? So 500,000 divided by 29 acres. That was about $17,000 an acre. What uh, township? Uh, Stella. Okay. Yeah. Stella is even further. Well, it's about 20 minutes from the water, but um, so I'm well, looking that, at that's... the satellite and it looks like it's 80% agricultural. Yep. There you go. Perfect. So good. Comp. That may be a good comp. Maybe not. I don't know. But um, final thing I'll say about this too, by the way, is options work great with vacant land when the, you just don't know what. Well, let's talk. Well, let's talk about that, Joe. Like on this deal, you know, let's say verbally you come to terms with a price, and now you want six months of due diligence. Now you're going to ask them to give you an option to purchase. Uh, uh, would you offer an option fee? Would you offer a different kind of money? How much money would you offer? And would it be in the form of an option fee? You know, sometimes they talk about, well, the money doesn't go hard. might say to the seller, listen, I, and I forget the numbers already, but I might say to them, I can't pay you 350 grand for your property, but I might be able to find somebody else who would. So let's do this. I'm going to give you a six month option agreement, which gives me the option to buy the property in six months for 350 grand. All right. And I tell them honestly, exactly open book, what I'm going to do. I'm going to go out and try to find somebody to sell this option agreement to. I might find somebody else that will be willing to pay 350 for it. And if I do, I'm going to sell them my option for an assignment fee of whatever. Um, and so now you've, you've locked that property up on an option. So you have the option to buy it. Um, sometimes I make it a flexible option, which means I tell the seller if they object, I might tell them, well, listen, let's do this. If you can find another buyer before I do, you can just cancel my option. Not a big deal. Don't worry about it if they bring that up that objection. But now I've got some equitable interest in that property under an option contract. And I can now what I would do is I would start calling all of the people that have bought vacant land in that area in the last six months or so. And I would call them, I'd skip trace them, I'd call them, I'd send them letters. How do people get a yeah. hold of me? Yes. Right. Um, you know, one of the easiest ways is uh, if you want to see my contracts, um, you go to simplelandcontract.com. This is the same contract I use for all my vacant land deals, and it's free. Go to simplelandcontract.com. And on when you go there to opt in to get that contract, there'll be an invitation to watch a, a webinar where I teach how to use that contract and how to find these vacant lots. And, you know, I, we don't do the big $300,000 deals. We're just doing little small deals that you can buy in a credit card. You know, you buy it for five grand, you sell it for 15 grand. Um, those are great little base hits. You can do two, three, four of those a month if you really wanted to. Um, those are those are the kinds of deals that I like to do. They're just easier. And uh, but if you go to Simple Land Contract, you can get 
more information on that contract and then get an invitation to watch a webinar on how to use it. Uh, and it's, 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 that's one of the best ways is to reach me. Um, I also have a YouTube channel. If anybody goes to YouTube and just does a search for Joe McCall or go to youtube.com slash at Joe dash McCall, or just go to YouTube and do a search for Joe McCall and you'll see my YouTube channel. I've got hundreds of videos on there. A lot of them lately have been on vacant land and how we find deals and how we buy them and you know how we sell them. It's really good. A lot of good free stuff on YouTube there. Joe, thank you so much for offering that valuable uh, resource at simplelandcontract.com. And uh, what a joy to have you on, Joe. I love hanging around you and talking to you at our mastermind uh, meetings, but uh, having you here on the podcast is fantastic as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jay. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Well, there you have it. Another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. And speaking of raising private money, you want to do these land deals. Uh, if you want to do some bigger land deals, it's more than, you know, 5,000 or whatever. Uh, you can pick up my book uh, right here, Where to Get the Money Now, uh, Private Money, right? Uh, well, I'll autograph this for you and mail it to you in the mail. And you can get this at jayconner, J-A-Y-C-O-N-N-E-R.com forward slash book, jayconner.com forward slash book. And I'll ship that priority mail to you in the mail. Thank you for joining me and my friend Joe McCall here on this episode of Raising Private Money. And I really appreciate the likes and subscribes. If you haven't been watching on YouTube, uh, be sure and ring that bell. Follow me. If you're listening on iTunes, Spotify, and the other platforms, be sure and follow as well so you don't miss out on the next upcoming episode. I'm looking forward to having you join me again right here again on the next episode of Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.